Hey guys, it's time for our chapter two study guide um, discussion. And chapter two is all about our normal distribution. Now, when we learned about the normal distribution in the first place, it was kind of a tricky thing at first. There were lots of little pieces you had to remember, et cetera, et cetera. But by now, the normal distribution should be pretty second nature to you guys. The AP test doesn't care whether you use your calculator or whether you use tables to get your answers. So most of us probably use the calculator, which is what I would recommend. But whichever method you have, you're probably pretty good at it already. There are rarely questions on the AP test that are just on the normal distribution, like just a chapter two question. The reason for that is it's the normal distribution is such like a huge topic that we use in all these other contexts, like sampling distributions, like probability, like we just use it everywhere. We're making just a nice, simple, easy, normal distribution problem usually doesn't happen. They assess it while also doing other chapters. So with that in mind, as we're going over our stuff in chapter two, I'm choosing to emphasize things other than just the normal distribution. There were a few other topics in this chapter. Um, there were percentile graphs, percentiles, z-scores, and transforming data. All of those topics are um, things you might not remember as well as the normal curve. So that is what I've chosen to emphasize more, especially in the free response questions. So let's go ahead and get to it. Um, starting off with our multiple choice here, just got done with my little speech about emphasizing other stuff. This guy is a good old normal distribution question. As soon as you see that word normal, you should be drawing yourself a curve. Get in the habit of drawing yourself your little normal distribution and labeling up the picture. It just provides clarity for everything you would want to do. So the mean is going to be 9. The standard deviation is going to be 2.5. This is a multiple choice question, so you wouldn't have to show any sort of work on it. But if this was like a free response question, you would want to make sure you're putting labels on these variables as well. I'm not going to do it because I'm drawing this with my trackpad right now. But write mu equals et cetera as you're filling that out. So we've got that going on. They want to know what percent will last more than 10 years. 10 would be somewhere over here on the right side of my picture. More than 10 is to the right. So I want to know that area right there. When you want to know the area, you're going to do normal CDF. And I am going to take like half an hour to write this out. So normal CDF is the game plan here. All right. And if you do a normal CDF calculation um, on the calculator, you just type it in your lower would be 10. Your upper would be a big number, mean 9, standard deviation 2.5. You should end up getting about 0.345, which is choice B on our first example. So just a good old normal CDF. Moving on to our second question. For number two here, they give a cumulative relative frequency graph. Fancy word for a percentile graph. So that phrase right there, cumulative relative frequency, is talking about percentiles. What percent of values am I bigger than? So they ask us for the IQR of this distribution. And remember that IQR is going to be Q3 minus Q1. Q3 is your 75th percentile, and Q1 is going to be your 25th percentile. So I have to find those on this picture. So my 75th percentile is going to fall there-ish. And if I follow that on down to my picture, it's going to be a little over 6.5, maybe like 6.6 .6 thereabouts. Not that my line was perfect there. Um, and then I would also need to find my 25th percentile, which is somewhere that was a really bad line, in this ballpark. Uh, trackpads. I got like 6.6 .6 minus 5.5, something like that. The closest choice by far is 1.2, which is option D on this example. So you locate each of those values and you subtract them to get your IQR. Please be careful with range and IQR. You'll look at the choices right here, A, B, C. A lot of kids will mistakenly write their range as like this to this. They won't actually subtract them. To find the range or the IQR, you do have to subtract your Q3 and Q1 values. Okay. So moving on to our third question here, this is a transforming data question. They give us this formula as they convert into minutes. I should have read the question. No, they're turning it into seconds and then they are subtracting 120. So this is our little formula right here. They say that my original mean is five and they say that the standard deviation in the problem going in is gonna be 2.3. Okay. Remember what I told you guys back when we learned about this in chapter 
two. The mean is our friend. He doesn't want to trick us in any way. Just do what common sense says to do, and you should be okay. So for the new mean of standard deviation and standard deviation for y, the mean, I'm just going to do 60 times 5 minus 120. I just plug my 5 in for x, and I see what I get. If you do that, you're going to get 180. So that is my new mean. Remember, though, that standard deviation is affected by multiplying and dividing, and it can't be negative. So you do the absolute value of that number, but it is not affected by adding and subtracting. If I take my data set and I add something to all the values or I subtract something, that doesn't change the spread, whether it's here or whether it's here. So all you do for your standard deviation is 60 times 2.3. And 60 times 2.3, I believe, is a 138. So this is going to be choice C on number three. Now, before I move on to the next problem here, a little bit spooky with these problems. I, it looks familiar. All three of our first pages of the multiple choice have gone B, D, C so far. I don't make these up in advance or anything like that. I just kind of throw problems out there in an order that looks good. So it's kind of crazy that we've gotten the same answers three times in a row. The second page is different though. So going on to our second page here, starting with um, this problem, this guy is going to ask what happens when you take the z-score of each point in a right skewed data set, okay? So if we're gonna take the z-score, of each of our data points, we're gonna subtract something and we're gonna divide by something. Subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. Linear transformations, which means add, subtract, multiply, divide, do not affect the shape of your distribution. The only thing that you really change, well, the main thing that changes shape is if you take two different things like an X and a Y and you mash them together. That's getting into like chapter six stuff, which we'll eventually get to. But if you just do numbers on a data set, you do not change the shape. So choices that talk about it, the new distribution being normal are incorrect. It is going to be skewed to the right. Okay, Shape doesn't change when you add, subtract, multiply, divide. If you subtract the mean and you divide by the standard deviation, you're doing what's called standardizing your scores. The mean, think about like a standard normal, the mean should be zero and the standard deviation should be one. You could show that algebraically if you think about it with subtracting 30 divided by 15, but standardizing means mean zero, standard deviation one, just like standard normal. So this one is gonna end up being choice D. All right, another percentile graph right here. They ask for this one, what proportion of racers finished in more than 2.15? So if I follow along on my picture, that's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of the 55th percentile. Okay, so if I just followed up, I'm somewhere around 55%, between 40 and 60, but closer to the 60. So the 55th percentile means I, at that mark, am higher than 55% of data points. Your percentile is what percent of data points you are equal to or below. Okay, so who are you better than, basically? But the question, a lot of people are going to choose 0.55 there. It asks how many or what proportion are more than 2.15 hours. That's going to be everybody else or the complement. It's 45% approximately of the data. So be careful with what they ask for. They even italicize that more. Correct answer on this one is C. And that takes us to our final multiple choice question. Um, I think this is another normal Problem. Yep, I see that word normal. So as soon as I see the word normal, I'm drawing myself a sweet normal curve. The mean is thought to be 845, and the standard deviation is 15. So I got myself a 15 here for my standard deviation. Now this time, the wording is a little trickier in terms of what they're asking for. What they say is that the owner is willing to have a 2.5% chance that a CD will be sold out, okay? So if the CD is sold out, it means that they bought, or the amount that they bought to bring to the store or whatever, the actual demand is higher. So the average demand is 845. We want to figure out like, okay, they would have to sell some number higher than 845, where this area the big area at the end is 2.5%. So this is going to be like our risk of um, 
not having enough CDs right there. Because if the mean is 845 and I buy like 850 or 860 or something like that, and I have a crazy day, well, that can totally happen. And if that did happen, then I would run out of CDs. It's the part on the right of the graph. Since you know the area, this is an inverse normal problem. And I don't know what calculator you guys have on you. The nice ones we use in class let you do a left area or a right area. Um, if you have like an older calculator that you're using at home and it doesn't say what kind of area it is, you need to make sure it's always a left area if it doesn't let you specify. So if you have an older calculator, you will do inverse normal with this area of 0.975. You would do the mean of 845, blah, blah, blah. But this would be your area if it doesn't let you specify. If it does, you just do a right area and you're good to go. If you do that, I worked this one out earlier, you should get answer choice D for your solution. So that takes us through our multiple choice. And as I said earlier in this video, with our free response here, um, the... Questions usually aren't just straight up chapter two. It's kind of hard to find a question that's only chapter two, but they will use it in other contexts. They'll use normal CDF and probability questions in sampling distribution questions in significance testing. Usually this is the chapter that they work into other chapters. This first problem though, does um, focus pretty much exclusively on chapter two. This is from the test in 2011, I think it was. So a little while back. And we're looking at some football players, I think it is. I don't know if they actually say football, but some sort of sports players here. And it gives them some stats about these people. And then uh, the first question says, based on the relationship between the mean, standard deviation, and minimum time, is it reasonable to believe that the distribution of 40-yard running times is approximately normal? So I'm going to start typing here. And for this problem, the idea is that um, this distribution can't really be normal. So I guess um, it is not reasonable to assume this distribution is normal. I'm going to come back to that, but I want to draw a quick picture here. They say in this problem that the mean, that was a really bad normal curve. The mean is 4.6. And then the standard deviation is 0.15, but your minimum is 4.4. So recall when we do these pictures, you're supposed to be able to go three standard deviations in each direction from the mean. We had that 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Um, in this problem, if my minimum is a 4.4, I can barely go one standard deviation over. I would be 4.45 for one standard deviation, and then beyond that, I'm gonna run out of space very quickly. So that is what you need to talk about in your answer for this problem. The best way to answer it um, is to just address that concept. So it is not reasonable to assume this distribution is normal. In a normal distribution, values should range approximately three standard deviations in each direction from the mean. In our data sets here, the minimum is barely over one standard deviation below the mean. So values on the left, side of the distribution certainly that's spelled wrong still spelled wrong wow and certainly can't be normally distributed uh that last sentence eh, could be a little stronger if i thought about it a little harder but the key here is you need to describe the minimum how that relates to the standard deviation and the fact that you should be able to go three standard deviations away i think the rubric for this question incorporates a z-score which you can do and talk about how the lowest z-score possible you do your 4.4 minus your 4.6 like do the z-score on the minimum and if you do that um it's like a negative 1.3 or something like that you could address it that way as well well. But you need to talk about characteristics of the normal distribution, how this could not be the case. All right, moving on then to part B on this question. B is asking us to calculate and interpret a z-score, which is good because I haven't had you do that yet in my little video here. Z-score goes value minus mean divided by your standard deviation. 
And you would be expected on this question to show your work. So please, anytime you have work to show, even if it's something pretty small, write it down, have it on there. It's better to be safe than to not put it and get penalized for it. So I would do in this problem, 370 minus the 310, and I would divide by 25. I'm not gonna write it because it would be awkward to do so, but I'm gonna type up that my z-score equals um, 2.4, if you actually calculate that. Please, on your solutions, show the work for that. Type it out or um, write it, whatever you need to do. It also asks us to interpret the z-score and recall that z-score is the number of standard deviations you are above or below the mean. So this athlete um, could lift or can lift 2.4 standard deviations more weight than the average player at his or her position. Okay, so standard deviation, number of standard deviations above or below the mean. If you're 2.4, 2.4 standard deviations more weight than the average. So that takes us to part C. And part C is asking us to compare these two different um, athletes. And in doing so, we need to decide which player would be better. So if I do that here, I just messed up my little setup, but I guess that doesn't matter. I just got to answer my one question here. Uh, okay. So for my last question, this is just a disaster. I'm going to go ahead and calculate the z-scores for both of these players and just write down what I get. So you guys need to make sure, again, show your work when you do this. But I'm just going to write down for A. Um, actually, I'm going to put it in terms of what they're doing. They had a 40-yard dash first. And for A, the z-score was going to be a negative 1.2. Negative 1.2. And for player B, their z-score on the 40-yard dash was negative 0.2. Then it also had them do a weightlifting thing. So in the weights, A has a z-score of 2.4 and B has a z-score of 2.6. Show that work. So let's talk about what these z-scores mean. Z-scores are great because they put everybody on the same scale. You standardize things. So you're not taking apples versus oranges. You're basically putting everything on the same playing field. And let's talk about who is better in each of these things. I'm going to start with weight first because weight is actually the more um, e the easier one to look at. Um, you'd rather be 2.6 standard deviations above the mean than 2.4. So this player, player B, is the better weightlifter. They're a little bit better. 2.6 is a little bit better than 2.4, okay? So B is the better weightlifter by a bit. And you can look at that by just seeing the numbers that they lifted. But when you look at the 40-yard dash, you have to remember, and it said this earlier in the problem, I didn't address it in the video, but a smaller time means you're faster. Smaller is better when it comes to the 40-yard dash, Okay, so the negative 1.2 is actually better than the negative 0.2. This guy, A, is a lot faster than B. So when you look at this, B is a better weightlifter, but eh, by like a little bit, 0.2 standard deviations, A is quite a bit faster than B. It's a full standard deviation faster. So the better choice in this problem is assuming that like, speed and weightlifting are of equal importance. If they weren't, then it would be a harder question to answer. But B, uh, sorry, A is going to be the better choice. Player A is the better choice. While their Z-score for weightlifting is 0.2 standard deviations below that of player B, their 40 yard dash time is one full standard deviation faster than player B. In other words, they can lift a little bit less, but they can run quite a bit faster. So that is gonna be the key to that problem there. Um, yeah, so using z-scores, anytime you see the words relatively speaking in a problem, it didn't come up here, but that's another key that you want to do a z-score. Z-score or standardized scores help you compare things on different levels.